Don't be afraid to ask your potential coaches, what healing work are they actively engaged in, right? Like who's mentoring them? What containers do they have? Um, what books have they read? What has their personal experience been? Because I feel like that ultimately is the question that is meant to hold us accountable, not a piece of paper, not a license, not, you know, years, you know, practicing, none of that. I want to know, like, do did you actually do your work? Are you doing your work? Have you cleared enough of your shit that you're not going to bring your shit into my shit? Welcome to the Conscious Leadership Podcast, where soulful entrepreneurship and holistic mind-body wellness meet to help you heal, discover your soul's purpose, and change the world. I'm your host, Gabby Ortega, entrepreneur, psychology expert, social media maven, and soulful leadership coach, and it's my mission to empower you into becoming the light leader you're meant to be. Each episode will be diving deep into topics that will help you gain personal mastery over your healing and mind-body wellness, while also giving you practical tips and tools to help you create, market, and scale a heart-centered business around your soul's purpose and life mission. Whether you're in the beginning of your self-awakening journey or a seasoned inner work god or goddess who's ready to step into their leadership as a soulpreneur, this is going to be your new favorite place to be. We know that you don't just want to feel happier and more fulfilled, but you want to deeply know yourself and powerfully step into your life's purpose while creating massive abundance around your mission. That's why I've created this podcast for you, the light leader of the next generation. Welcome home. I'm so glad you're here. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Conscious Leadership Podcast. I am, as always, your host, Gabby. I am so excited because today we are just like, it's totally unplanned. We're going to be talking about all the things that you guys have been asking us and the things that we have been a little nervous to talk about, um, all about what we're doing here really with the system that we're creating, what we're smashing, um, and why we as therapists uh, actually didn't continue on with licensure and why we decided it's time for a change. So I think this is a much needed conversation. I think you'll agree. Um, my my co-host today is Amber. We're really not going to be interviewing. We're just going to be chatting. Um, by the way, Amber Gordon, if you guys are watching, you know exactly who this is. Um, if you're listening, you may or may not. Amber is my co-pilot here at Ohm. She is literally my number two. She helps me run the Ignite program and is just also my maid of honor and my best friend. And ah, I just love you so much. But she's also a clinical therapist, a self healer, uh, a chronic illness warrior, and just a fucking badass coach. And I'm just really excited to jam out with you because you and I have been talking a lot about this within the containers that we run at home, right? Like when within Ignite and you're in the mastermind right now as a student. And one of the reasons that we really attract the people we attract is because of the fact that we've called out what we've seen and um, aren't afraid to really talk about some of the things that maybe other people in the clinical space or the traditional world um, might be afraid to shed some light on. So forward kind of note, we are in no way, shape or form trashing any modality of healing here. The point is to really shed some light on um, how the system of mental health in the United States at least currently operates and has operated, why we have so much distrust in this system, um, the, what the things that we've experienced both as um, patients and as uh, clinicians, both on either side, and uh, you know, really just exploring what it is that we're doing here. If we're healers, if the point is to heal the world, if the point is to connect with other people and to elevate humanity, why is it that we are constantly burned out, constantly underappreciated, struggling with so many things, and there's so many of us that are still unhealed because we just don't have the time or the energy or the um, financial ability because we're not being paid uh, or well uh, to be able to really heal ourselves in the way we need to when working with the world. So lots to dig into here. And just remember, take what resonates, leave the rest. And this is all in an effort to... Uh, to simply just open up a conversation about what we think healing needs to be and what it is right now. So Amber, uh, welcome, welcome. Long winded intro, but welcome to the podcast back. Um, tell me a little bit about why you didn't get licensed and your kind of professional clinical journey. 
Yeah. So this is actually really fresh for me. I just very recently checked off all of the boxes in terms of being able to go and get my license. It would have been a matter of taking an exam um, here in my state of Pennsylvania. It would have been a matter of taking an exam and filling out some paperwork and obviously more money, right? Um, so you know, much money. To, to go ahead and get my license. I have all of the supervised hours. I have everything signed off on ready to go. And when I was sitting with finally being able to get this thing that I had worked so hard for and seemed like it was this pinnacle um, in my career, it didn't feel good anymore. It didn't feel like I wanted it. It didn't feel aligned. It felt like a waste of my energy. Again, speaking for me personally, it felt like a waste of my energy to study for this exam, learning all of these like mostly outdated modalities and practices so that I could answer questions on a test that in no way, shape or form is reflective of how I actually operate as a clinician and my fitness to then hold space for my clients, right? It's mm -hmm just me regurgitating information that I learned however many years ago in graduate school that yeah. to be completely honest, I wasn't really using all that much of it with my clients anyway, right? Like yeah. I'm using things from my personal healing journey, my own experience, all of the extra trainings, all the extra books, all the extra podcasts. Those are the things that I'm actually bringing into my session that are helping my clients. So I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. And then also I'm basically giving this, <laughs> this system, uh, a leash to hold me on. Mm -hmm. I'm essentially giving them permission. And I understand where on one hand, it's important to have the accountability aspect, right? Like the whole point of having a licensed clinician is that there is something that they are answerable to. Yeah. Which is again, you guys a kind of a big lie. I'm not, you know, it, it mm -hmm. kind of is a, and this is from two people who were literally in a part of the system. We were working as therapists. We've done the thing. We've been to school, multiple, um, educate multiple levels of education. And the, our professors, our, our supervisors were the ones telling us this. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't something that, this is something we observed and something we experienced, but also like, this was what was taught to us. Well, this is just how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then once I really started thinking like, well, why, why is it that way? And like, does that even make sense for me? I kept getting a big fat sacred, as we like to say, no, like a big sacred, no. And because I'm like, I don't want to be accountable to this system. To me, this system is broken. This system does not reflect how I feel aligned with working with my clients. And also in my clinical experience, I would say about half my supervisors have been absolutely incredible, amazing bomb healers. And then the other half have been honestly stuck in their own trauma. They have been unethical yeah. and I have personally suffered harm at the hands of those, yeah. those supervisors. So I'm like, all right, if we're looking at like 50, 50 here, like I don't like those odds. And as, as a, a white person, if I learned anything from BLM, it was to really question the narrative. To really sit back and yeah. be like, okay, what is it? That, is... Like, how did this all happen? Like, right. how did we get here? Where did all of this come from? Like, who is this so, serving? Like, who, who is this, this serving? actually serving? Yeah, yes. yeah, hundred percent. I actually was um, looking, uh, of course, like flipping through TikTok the other day, and this is kind of loosely tied to all of this. But it's like we we ask where these things came from, the DSM all of this research, who's funding it, what is their agenda, who's getting what out of what, who's paying who for what, like it's all so connected. Um, and there are agendas. But I was talking to somebody um, the other day um, about this thing that I had seen, I saw on TikTok and oh my God, it's like escaping me, hold on, hold on. Oh, yes where t the Texas State Board, because as maybe you don't or do know, um, our educational system is state-based, right? So our state governments decide what it is that we are taught in public school. And part of this whole thing is that, uh, you know, again, it's a narrative. 
It's like someone wrote that textbook. That textbook was then programmed into us and it either says one thing or says another. And whoever wrote it and whatever they felt, and this is back to the mental health, back to the healing, back to self-awareness and self-responsibility and trauma cycles, they put on paper what they felt was the right thing maybe to do, but is actually not the right thing to put on paper and left out things. So for example, the Texas State Board has now decided to basically remove um, Native American history, um, the Martin Luther King speech, um, so many different really important parts of American history that are not so flattering. And in order to erase the kind of hor horrific things that have happened to communities of color um, over and in indigenous communities over the course of the history of the United States. Um, and, and someone asked me on TikTok, well, why does this matter? Let Texas do their own thing. And I said, well, here's why it matters. Texas Instruments is the largest producer and distributor of textbooks to all American public schools. 99.9% .9 of schools in America use textbooks written and distributed by Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is based in Texas. Those textbooks are governed by the Texas Board of Education by the government of Texas. So now you could be in a, let's say, a state where that maybe that's not the belief that people are like, whoa, we can't erase history. That's fucked up because it is. Um, no matter how much shame you feel around it, right? Um, that erasure is not okay. And they're buying textbooks from Texas Instruments. And so what they're actually teaching students is whatever's in those books. And that does erase the history that we're trying so hard to maintain so that we can heal and move on um you know or like not maintain but so hard to like remember you know mm -hmm. and keep in mind all of these things like it's really mind-blowing the kind of gaslighting that happens on this level and um this is part of the system that we have to question who is writing the history who's creating the narrative and i know my computer agrees because my chimes are going off um <laughs> But what That's is the spirit guys being like, right? Yes. Just embrace yes. it. Meditation. My meditation teacher always said, like, you never know what's going to happen. You have to be able to always be uh, be able to drop in like that, whether you're on a train or, or you know, walking down the street or whatever it is. Same thing. Um, but it is very much like question that narrative. Ask yourself. And when I was in school to become a therapist, what really turned me off from um, joining the system and I had a really beautiful experience in my graduate school and in my doctoral uh, program because they were both happened to be so um so forward thinking and so in the like 10 steps ahead of where the system is that I got spoiled and I thought that's where we were um but uh one of the things just kidding that, just kidding right like one of the things that really bothered me was that yeah in order to be reimbursed we have to diagnose that feels unethical. Mm -hmm. If we're not doing out of pocket therapy, like and charging people an hourly rate that's aside from insurance, but we're working with vulnerable populations, we could have somebody who doesn't meet criteria and they'll we'll have to come up with something. And that diagnosis is on your permanent record forever and ever and ever. And mm -hmm. we have to many times come to these conclusions after one session. Yep. Yep. Because to get the insurance to pay for that one session, you have to provide them with a diagnosis, which is why like everyone ends up getting diagnosed with adjustment disorder because it's like the most benign thing. And it's just like, this is an accepted practice between everyone, right? We're like, yep, well, it sucks that like we have to give them diagnosis. We'll just throw, you know, say adjustment order disorder because that's nice and benign and like that's not too bad. That way insurance yeah. will cover it. But like, why do we have to come up with something? Why are we playing by these rules if they don't feel aligned, if they don't feel good, if it actually at your core feels unethical to be coming up with a diagnosis? It feels and this so is, gross. This is where we, as the people who are deciding whether to participate in this system or not participate in this system have the power mm -hmm. and we have to stand up because ultimately every time we decide to just play along, that is us condoning this practice. Yeah. And as somebody in a position of privilege, because I am right. Like I, I am in Pennsylvania. 
I live in an upper middle class area. I am a white woman, right? I have all of this privilege and it's up to me to say no. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with, no, I'm not giving you my money. No, I'm not going to participate in this any longer. And, you know, yeah, threaten me all you want. It's like, oh, well, you're not going to be able to take insurance. Well, you know what? I don't want to play by your stupid rules anyway. So see ya. It just feels really wrong. And then there are some, some times where, when I remember like in my internship, I was kind of like asked to give personality disorder diagnoses. And I'm like, you know that you have to work with someone for years to be able to assess whether or not it's a personality disorder, because at that point you're telling them it is you and it's not going to change. And that is much different than, Hey, you're depressed. Hey, you're anxious. Hey, like you have trauma. Hey, you have stuff we can work on. This is like, this is you. And to say that to somebody is completely like people's identity shifts and they start to identify with these diagnoses. And there have been many times where like I was interning and I would go to my supervisor and say, they're not appropriate for therapy. They're really high functioning. Everything's fine. They're just feeling kind of sad because they went, they're going through a really rough breakup or they're feeling really lost because they, I don't know, they they don't know what their purpose is. And that was like, not something that needed to be in therapy, not someone who was clinically Uh, mentally ill, which is what therapy is supposed to be. Uh, Just a reminder, therapy is supposed to be a medical practice to help people who are mentally ill and meet full diagnostic criteria in the DSM for disorders. It's not, we're not supposed to go every week and share what we did that week. And like, you know, like, I don't know, like whatever's on our mind or like, it's for those of us in crisis. It's like when you have a broken bone, you go to the doctor, you get surgery. That's what therapy is supposed to be for. And, but there hasn't, but there's never been another option, right? Like, so what do we do if we don't fit into that mold? So everybody's Mm -hmm. just kind of like been shoved in there. And to me, that's just really, it's been an unethical thing. And it made me feel really icky diagnosing when I felt like, I didn't feel like they were like, you know, they didn't meet it, the criteria and I didn't feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where, you know, where did it become normalized that, uh, you know, in the time of like Freud and the psychodynamic theory and all that stuff, like it became normalized for people to be going to see their therapist once, sometimes multiple times a week for years Mm -hmm. years. And this is where like, I I sat back and I was like, ultimately, like, I feel like if I'm not working myself out of a job, what am I doing? Like, I don't Mm -hmm. want my clients to be dependent on me. I don't want my clients to feel like they have to come see me every single week for the rest of their life. Like that to me means like, I'm not giving you the tools. I am not helping you believe in your own abilities. I am not doing you any favors. If you feel like you have to go out there and then come back to me every week, every single week, we're not giving you what you need to heal and move on. And honestly, too, like when, when people, people have the tools, they help others. Like you automatically start to tell your friends and your close circle and the healing reverberates. But if you're coming back week and week after week after week, what is really being done? Like we're taking money and that also feels that unethical. taking money. Right. But that's where we, we examine this and where is that it's financially driven. Mm-hmm. It is financially driven. You tell me how much healing somebody is going to be able to get in if we're being real, it's 45 minutes, right? Like even if your therapeutic hour is 50 minutes or 55 minutes, by the time you get them in there, they, they get sat down, you kind of recalibrate so that you're, you know, in each other's space. And then they actually get to processing how much time you're actually processing with your therapy clients, Mm, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. And then you have to take the time to wrap up. So you're not like, Oh, okay. Sorry. Sessions over. See ya. And then you have to schedule work that get done. Right. That's if you're lucky, if you're lucky and like, so like, yeah, of course they're going to have to come every single week for years because they're only getting 15 minutes of actual processing time with you. Yeah. That's messed up, man. It is. It is. And like, you know, I think there's a lot of, and this is difficult to talk about because this is why we have licenses, right? Like this is why we have a governing board. This is why we have standardized educational systems for like educating our therapists, getting them out there, treating them, like getting them so they can do the work that they need to do. But like, it doesn't guarantee that the person you're working with knows what they're doing is ethical or is going to show up in a healing way for you. And I think that there is this kind of, um, it's an interesting conversation between therapy and coaching and coaching is unregulated and people have had really bad experiences with coaches and like, but 
therapy is regulated and I've had bad experience, horrible experiences with therapists and psychologists I went to go see um, as someone who was suffering from PTSD and depression and all of these things and anxiety. Um, and clients that I saw as a coach had some really horrific experiences that, you know, I, I don't want to share their stories, but I will say I was very close to like asking them who these people were so I could report them because I do feel like they are not just in violation of ethics, but dangerous. And mm -hmm. um, I think that there is this false notion that a license means ethics, like even though they pass a test doesn't mean that they're acting ethically. Even if, um, you know, they do well on whatever exam, it doesn't mean that in the office, they actually understand and embody that. And so I don't know if you what, have anything to say about that, but I, I just know that also like everything was great for me when I was doing the clinical work when I was in school. And then when I got into my internship and actually saw how it was like, you see how the real world quote unquote works, that's when I got completely disgusted with the entire thing because it wasn't what I signed up for. You know, it was therapists being abused by supervisors and by unhealed therapists that they were working with spilling their shit on top of everybody else. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but most schools only require like 60 hours of personal therapy. Like that's yep. not a lot of therapy for someone. Yep. And that's even like, and how effective those 60 hours are also depends on how effective the person that you're working with is right. Like art, because no offense to me, you, Gabby, anyone else that's a therapist out there, like we're really good at like covering our bases. I, I can't even tell you how many times I went to therapy. And even as a, a teenager, I would end up being the therapist to my therapist. Oh my God. Me too. If you're in the audience, please. If you're in the know. audience, then right? you <laughs> how many times? Can I tell like, you, I knew my psychologist, like, first of all, her nine-year-old son, he has a learning disorder. And then like, they were getting divorced and it was really messy. And she yeah, was like, you at her should office. not have known all of that. <laughs> Do you like, bitch, you know how much money I paid the psychologist? And like for two years, I went to go see her and I, nothing changed for me like at all. Yeah. Cause you were giving her therapy. <laughs> yeah. And not saying that, look, my mom's a psychologist. She does a hell of a good job. She fucking cares. She goes above and beyond. Granted, she's doing more coaching um, because she is, I, I love her. I'm not going to say what she's doing, but I'll say she's giving her clients a lot of support and uh, more, more than the traditional psychologist will. Um, not that that's a requirement, but there are really great psychologists and therapists, but for the most part, they're just fucking tired and burnt out. And that's the system too. The system works both ways. It works in the sense that it, it you know, kind of weaponizes mental health against um, like people and humans and kind of turning what is the soul into a diagnosable thing. Um, and then you have like this other part of it, which is that we're kind of expected to work for free and we're kind of used and abused by the same system that we're supposed to uphold and um, provide services for working 80 hours a week, holding a caseload of 40 clients. How effective can we possibly be if we don't have enough money for rent and we are carrying a caseload for of like 40 people's deep, dark journeys of the soul? That to me is like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> no, that's that's literally systemized hazing is yeah. what it is. Like if we really think about this and because like all of our supervisors, if you talk to them, they're like, yeah, you know, being an intern, it's rough, man. This but like, what I, I like I had to do it. So you have to do it. You got to pay the piper. You got to pay your dues before you can hopefully eventually get your license. And then once you do get your license, you can then negotiate with the insurance companies and tell them you'll charge $200 an hour only for them to come back and tell you they'll only pay you $125 an hour. Oh yeah. And by the way, you have to like cover all of your costs and your overhead and you have to pay taxes out of that. So at the end of the day, you are lucky if at the end of all of this strife and struggle and like, you know, tears and hard work, you're bringing home mm, maybe like between 30 and $50 an hour. Yeah. $30 and, and that's $50 an hour for a, a good therapist. Like that is insanity it's crazy. And then, so what does that make you do as a therapist in order to pay your bills? You then have to see eight people at least five days a week, at least 
so that you can just pay your bills because, you know, the cost of education is astronomical. I pay a thousand dollars a month in student loans, a thousand dollars. We invest in the system too. They take our money and then they're like, we're also going to set it up. So you can't make any money and you consistently stay burnt the fuck out. And truly though, I honestly think this is part of the crumbling of the system and of the paradigm that we're the paradigm shift we're seeing happen during this like age of Aquarius is that like we're realizing that healers are the most powerful people in the world and every human being has the potential and is already a healer yes this yes. power resides within each and every one of us but what we have fallen into is a system that sees that and keeps us small why because mm-hmm. guess what happens when we decide that we're going to take our knowledge our gifts our intuition our drive and our like everything that we want to do and we take it and do it on our terms like that's dangerous that's a new world and that's what we're creating at home and that's what why we're so passionate about <laughs> what we do here. Because y'all have the education if you're from the clinical space. Um, if you're not, you've taken courses, I'm sure you're going to. Um, but there there has to be another option other than this system that takes advantage of um, clinicians, causes them to not be able to stand in their fullest power so they can do the best work possible, heal the people that they need to heal. Um, so the world can change for the better and we can elevate as a species. But like also like the people that are coming in are being told that they're sick. And also every DSM diagnosis, I want to very, very strongly drive this home is based on empirical research, right? So we're all like, oh yeah, so all of this must be accurate. What I learned in school killed me. The DSM is based on research that is primarily and sometimes solely done with a very specific population. What does that mean? It means that when they came up with these diagnoses, when they did all these tests comparing all these people and trying to figure out what was going on and how do we, you know, figure out how to help and heal and they were only testing white cisgender, heterosexual, college educated, middle class, able bodied males. And like, how many of us fit that? Um, that ain't me, bitch. Like, I don't. That's, not, that's not me either. Like, <laughs> that's not. That's and it. It takes into account zero um, cultural competency. Um, for example, there are, um, you know, uh, just until recently, um, transgender was considered a mental illness, mm-hmm. which blows my mind that that was in there as a diagnosable mm-hmm. mental illness. Um, that's insane. Uh, also, in many cultures, um, there is a spiritual element of someone who identifies as n- neither gender or both genders, um, and they're revered. They're not ill. They're actually seen as shamanic healers and prophets and connected to the spiritual realm. And so how the fuck? <laughs> like, can we sit here and have someone come in perhaps from a culture like that and say to them, you're really sick when that's not the truth. And maybe not for them. It just doesn't take into account the nuance of the individual at all. And so when we standardize things, we take the humanity out of it, I think is the point, you know, when yeah, we standardize and- these things. Yeah, we were pathologizing power. Yeah. We're pathologizing power, which I think, you know, also goes back to you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier today about how much forget like, you know, really more niche populations. But just if we're 50 50 it, women, yeah, women have been completely oppressed and essentially like demonized by the mental health system and like oh yeah even with you know like we think about it the the institutions and hysterica hysteria and histrionic personality and all these things and now gabby and i like we get to sit with these amazing groups of women in our containers who are so sensitive so emotional so tapped in so turned on and the scary thing is not that long ago they would have been seen singled out and taken away yeah How is that system serving us? How is that system serving us, right? And it's again, whose agenda? Whose agenda to keep us small and keep us hidden so that we can't fully embody and unleash what we are here to do? And I feel more than ever such a intense, intense 
pull and just like there is no time left like we don't have the luxury maybe we had the luxury of discovering our our inner power and our inherent calling like to step into the space of healing as women but like we don't have the luxury of that anymore so if you're going through the traditional system right now and you're like man i feel so called to heal you do not need to go get a master's degree and like go to the traditional schooling and do all of that there are so many wonderful psychologists psychiatrists theorists philosophers our anthropologists sociologists so many neurobiologists you can learn from all of these people and come up with something that works for you versus getting a pre-prescribed education and being fed into um, a system that is broken and absolutely used to weaponize um to, it's weaponized against it's 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 a very fine line it can be weaponized right like in so many ways and it used to be more than not for women and for communities of color you know and so so many years ago not many years ago but in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, you know, you could be married and uh, or how or be living in a family, be a woman and um, just something you just have emotions and you're living your life. And what for whatever postpartum, reason, right? Like postpartum you, you depression, know, like hormones. Like <laughs> yeah, like and just like and just really, I guess, you know, making other people who don't understand the psyche or emotions or whatever, like uncomfortable, your husband, brother, father, male, who was obviously in charge of you because you're a woman could literally put you in a car and lock you away in a psych ward. And there would be no questions asked. There would be no real fair diagnosis, no real fair like kind of evaluation. It would just be a, hey, my wife has hysteria. She needs to be in here. And then she get like a lobotomy or, you know, would be stayed in there forever. And then, you know, the guy would go out and marry someone else and go have another life. And everybody would, you know, it's like, it's it's insanity. Um, and, and, you know, in so many ways, like, um, in California, like as liberal as it is, has a bad history too. I, and I don't know if you know about this, it was interesting. There were so many public mental health facilities in California up until Ronald Reagan's presidency. And at the end, he actually went through and closed every single public mental health facility, which is why we have such a horrible homeless population crisis, especially in Los Angeles, where a lot of those places were located um, because he was like, well, fend for yourself. And now we have a lot of really um, sick individuals who do need therapy, who do need that attention, who need um, that space. And meanwhile, we're completely ignoring the people who actually need treatment um, and not helping those people. We're leaving them on the streets to die. And everybody else, we're kind of forcing diagnoses on so that we can pay the bills and keep the lights on. Like that, to me, is just like what like how and that's that was my reaction like as i started to see the pieces i was like oh so this is gonna be it um and i was like no nah, i'm not doing this i just couldn't i just could not i couldn't show up ethically and in my integrity in, to myself in if i stayed in that system yeah and this is where i think so many people are feeling that way and but they're like well what else is there what else like i want to heal i feel called this is my life's purpose and like this is the only avenue that's been presented to me if i want to work with people in this way i have to participate in this system otherwise i can't use my gifts or i can't participate in my my purpose yeah and this is where the conversation about coaching gets really interesting because gabby and i have also talked about this many many times before where coaching is given this really bad reputation on purpose by the therapy community. I can't I'm guilty of it. I'm totally guilty. Oh, of it. Yeah, no. This. And like, I've actually, I've written posts about this. I've talked about this. Um, when I was in graduate school, I also looked down on coaches. I believe the narrative where, you know, I was this prestigious person who was working so hard to be able to get my master's degree. And then I was going to get licensed. And then I was going to join this upper echelon of like elitists, like, <laughs> Oh my God, I feel so seen. I was like, right. this is it. This is like, and I'm going to open these doors. Yeah, and, and I was like, oh, all those, the torture is going to be over and it's going to be ethical. It's going to be amazing no. and ideal. Yeah. No, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be those bottom feeder coaches, right? The people who, who didn't have the chops to like stick it out, who, you know, wanted to cut corners. Or who are doing fake therapy. Fake therapy. Or like, you know, they didn't feel like paying these exorbitant student loans that I am taking on because I really care. Which again is like, 
you guys, that's not a, ba a badge of honor, a medal of honor to say that you have like $300,000 of student <laughs> debt and you're working for $13 an hour at a Literally mental health clinic. Literally trying not to cry like, right now. Yeah. Bitch, like, let's talk about your self-worth because like that has nothing to do with anything. Like that is so wrong and also like elitist. Like who can afford that? Who can afford to put themselves into that kind of debt? And who gets approved for loans like that? You know, it, it really leaves out a lot of people and who has the time and energy? Able-bodied people, perhaps not mm -hmm. everybody, let's say people with chronic illness or with children or with extra things going on, um, PTSD, lots of anxiety, have to go at my own pace. Um, but yeah, this stuff is like, it's really interesting because when I learned all this stuff, I just kind of looked around and go, so we're, nobody's gonna talk about this. Like nobody, we're not gonna talk about this. And everybody was like, shh. And I was like, I don't even know. <laughs> like I'm out, I'm out. I'm so nauseous. I fucking can't. Like I was like, it made me want to just fly into a rage. And I was like, I give up. But there is another way in the coaching space has like, literally it was by accident that I started coaching. It was because I had a friend who was a life coach in my master's program. I swear to God, I'd never even like all I heard of when I heard I had only known about like Tony Robbins. Um, I had no clue about the coaching world. I was like clueless. And of course, Tony Robbins um, seemed like a total hack. And I was like, this is bizarre. And I had all these other people in my ear saying, oh, yeah, coaching's unregulated. All the things we said. And then I met this girl and we became good friends and she was really cool. And, and after we were talking, I was like, oh, so what do you do? And she goes, oh, I'm a life coach. My husband is an ex NFL player and we have a daughter and life coaching is like what works for me. Um, I'm now going to become a therapist to kind of legitimize myself. And which again is that narrative of like, oh, like you aren't good enough. Like you need to be going through this formal program. So full circle, my Instagram kind of blew up while I was in school because I was self-healing and I was like, oh my God, all the therapists I paid who told me about their life, they were, they should have been doing this stuff. Um, <laughs> it's working. Let me like, but it's also other things, not just therapy stuff, but somatic stuff I was learning outside of school and like yogic practices and Buddhist psychology and spirituality, like this whole crazy thing. But, um, Oh my God. What was my point? But basically the I was, point learning... was how you learned about coaching by accident. Oh yeah. But how I learned about coaching yeah. by accident was like, I was learning all these things. And she was like, I was like, listen, I, I graduated. My goal was to become a doctor, right? Like I went to go to my master's program because side note, um, for those of you fellow theater nerds, I, uh, my BA is in dramatic arts for acting. Uh, <laughs> and if y'all hadn't noticed already, if you hadn't noticed already, I love it. Um, but no, I, I never act. I'm just, I have a big personality, which I really then is why I could never be an actor because I had to actually be someone else. And it was really just, I just have a big personality. That's what it is. Um, but anyway, I went, so I had to go to my master's program before I could get my doctorate. And I thought the doctorate was the thing that was going to save me. It was going to make my life so legitimate. Everybody's going to respect me. And I was going to be so wealthy and I was going to be helping people and all these things. So I graduated my master's program and they're like, yeah, so, um, internships. And I was like, yeah, great. So you pay me full time. I see patients full time. I get my supervision. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to work in school, going back to school, to get my doctorate. And everybody was like, ah, ha, ha. no, that's like not how that works. So I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, you're lucky if you get paid for an internship, which by the way, for those of you listening, you need like in California, at least like 3000 clinical hours. Um, mm -hmm. that is like at least three years of like like full work weeks. Um, and that is intense, 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 emotional and mental labor. So, um, they want you to do that for free. And my question is, if you're doing that full time for free, either you're, uh, like, I don't know, married to someone really rich and they're taking care of you. You have a rich family that takes care of you. Um, I don't know what your situation is, but I know I couldn't do that. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry. I just paid for a master's degree. I just passed. I graduated. Um, I have it. Uh, very concerned about the fact that like a master's degree, I was making, like, I also need to in. eat and pay for housing. So I'm just like, <laughs> I, I, that was, it just, you know, that meme with all the algorithms and she's just like staring up into space and all the numbers. <laughs> That's how I felt because I was like, as they're telling me this, I'm like, do you hear yourself? Like how? 
it just was not computing. And then I realized like, I'm not going to be able to go back to school to get my doctorate. I'm not going to be able to go where I want to go and really learn. My point was I wanted to learn everything. It's, it became more about like, wow, this stuff is helping me heal myself. It's really feeling like my calling. I want to keep going. And I couldn't do it that way. So I'm like, how am I going to make this happen? And my friend goes, you should life coach. And I was like, what? And all what of a, a sudden, dirty word, dirty, dirty, what a dirty word. Right. And I was like, oh my God, like, is that even a thing? And she was like, yeah, you can totally do it. And she's like, you're more like skilled than a lot of coaches out there or whatever that story is. And I was like, oh, I was like, I don't know about that, but uh, you know, okay. Cause I had some people reach out on Instagram were like, you know, I want to work with you, but obviously I couldn't work with them as a therapist and couldn't do therapy. So I started looking at the differences, therapy and coaching became very clear to me. They are two different things. And I was like, actually, I feel like I'm more naturally energetically a coach anyway let me just see how this goes so you know and this is what i tell all my fucking therapists and psychology and clinical friends like you know you're going to the hottest nightclub like you're waiting to get into the hottest nightclub right the nightclub of healers and like you're waiting to get in and jam out an ecstatic dance with like all your healing friends and like take over the world and like bring light and love and all that stuff and there's a line of like 800 people around the block and like there's like 5 million forms to fill out and, and nobody's happy and it just doesn't make any sense and nobody's getting healed and nothing's actually getting done. Um, and I found this side door where no one, very few people were like looking and they were like, I was like, well, this, seems, this feels easier. <laughs> yeah, let me just see what's there. And I peel that back. And, uh, you know, kind of went in and realized like, this is actually a really beautiful way for those of us who do not want to continue in the traditional system, a place for us to go. Um, and also to be able to work with people if we don't necessarily identify with loving and feeling a purpose with working with those who are mentally ill and really need treatment. And we don't identify with that kind of work. And we are kind of naturally coaching and working with um, people who are dealing with different things, more high higher functioning individuals, like not crisis stuff, um, but really emotional management and skills and regulation training and goal setting and highest self creation. And then we're bringing in the woo and the meditation and we want to do like, we want to connect the dots and do all these different things and art, arts and creative work and drama therapy and all these things. Um, it, it stops being therapy, right? It starts being really coaching. Like and there's a reason insurance will not reimburse you for any of that because yeah, like, at all, like re insurance right. will not reimburse you for holistic practices or for meditation or for the things that actually science is now backing up as legitimate things that will help us very quickly heal. So anyway, the system is outdated. It's running on like, it's running on stuff from like the sixties. It's really just totally antiquated. Um, but I think when I saw this opportunity, I felt grossed like cut out. And I was like, I had that programming that was like, Ooh, like you shouldn't even look at that. And then when I looked, I was like, actually, this is an incredible space that for me as an individual, I thrive in, I get to make my own schedule. I get to work with whoever I want to. I get to really share myself. I am such a sharer. Like that has always been historic. <laughs> I got myself like talking for 20 minutes here, but it's like, I'm a sharer. And you know, I like to share my personal journey and I like to open my heart. And you can't do that as a therapist. You're not allowed to. And obviously we don't want to be egotistical, but also we, I want people to see that I'm doing what I tell my clients to do. And that's really important, really important when you're working with, you know, someone in their integrity. So long story short, don't judge, don't judge a book by its cover, but I think, you know, the coaching space, if you are clinically trained and burned out and identifying with what we're talking about here and wanting to kind of have freedom to regulate yourself and what you do and how you approach healing also, because not for nothing, this really erases intuition. Um, you know, uh, traditional therapy erases us being able to tap into intuition, to tap into indigenous practices. I have medicine women on both sides of my family that run for, oh my God, millennia. And like, since we've existed and um, I get to use those practices with my coaching clients and it serves them so deeply and it feels so good for me. It's how I was meant to show up as a healer versus me trying to fit into some box that just, did not feel aligned, you know? Yeah. I knew that like, for me, when I was, I always thought that I was like, wow, like I'm like a really good therapist. Yes. I was a really good therapist, but I also realized now that I was just channeling. 
I was just channeling because I would freak my clients out all the time. I'd say something and they would be like, oh my God, how did you know that? Like, where did that come from? And I'm like, and then I'm, I'm like sitting there. This was like before I really like got into energetics and my spiritual practice, and everything like that. I'm like, I don't know. I guess maybe I was picking up on their body language or whatever. No, that That's was like specific. You're like, you're talking about a metaphor and they're like, oh my God, that was my dream last night. Right. Yeah. And they're like, where, why did you, why did you make like a basketball metaphor? I'm like, I don't know anything about basketball. And all of a sudden I feel called to make a basketball metaphor. Same. They're like, that's exactly what makes sense to me. Right. But like, that's like light language talks in metaphor. Like we get downloads in metaphor. We channel in metaphor. Um, so here I am like thinking, I'm just like, you know, the bomb.com, which, you know, which I mean, like you are like, <laughs> yeah, but like, but, but it was, but now it's so cool. Cause I get to sit with my clients and be like, Oh wait, some, something's coming through here. So I'm, I'm something's coming through. H how, how does this sound like, you know, what, what is this for you? And I, I get to do that. And guess what? They're not weirded out by it. I don't scare anybody anymore. They're like really excited when I get downloads, I get to show up as myself and it feels so, so, so good. And I know for me, when I leave a coaching session, I feel so charged, yeah. so charged up. And at the tail end of me working full time as a therapist, I would have my therapy sessions for the, the therapy clients that I wasn't actually doing coaching with, because those of you who are therapists, you know, the clients that you're actually coaching and you know, the clients that you're actually doing. Therapy. Yeah. If you're being real with yourself, like, <laughs> and let's, and, and, you know, not for nothing, like a lot of the newer modalities are coaching modalities that insurance companies. Oh yeah. Like are. motivational interviewing, Re a lot of CBT practices, mindfulness. Because like, let me yeah. tell you something you don't heal. First of all, a lot of the stuff that they use DBT for, yes, it's practical. Um, like they use it for different kinds of, you know, border borderline and, you know, emotional regulation problems, but a lot of the emotional re dysregulation is from the nervous system, from trauma. So you're not actually healing anybody's emotional dysregulation or, um, you know, personality disorder, if you want to call it that or whatever it is, um, by giving people journal prompts every week, although that may help with self-awareness and may help with some basic regulation, you're not going to heal the root of what is causing the dysfunction, which is like, isn't that the fucking point? We're not to healed to, to actually management actually heal. And this is where like our society, we're constantly covering up the symptoms, right? It's like, you know, take a pill, cover up the symptom here. This will like get you through so you can emotionally regulate enough so that you can function, but you're constantly going to feel like you need to keep coming back to this practice or coming back to this therapist or coming back to, because we're not actually healing anything. We're not going down deep into the root. And this is where I feel so, so passionately about this because what has ended up happening in my view is that we have so many people out there who are feeling called to heal, but then they don't actually have the time or the energy to commit to their own healing practice. Yeah. And that's where unfortunately therapists end up bringing things into session that like are not appropriate are unethical. They're, they are having like bias. They are projecting. They are because how can you do your own deep healing work? If you were seeing eight to 10 clients, five to seven days a week, like, how can you, how can you do that? Yeah. How like, can you, you cannot, I, it's, it's, uh, you no, you absolutely can't. And that's again, why we're not here, like demonizing therapists or therapy. No, like, not, at like, not at all. Not at all. We just understand that like, when we show up out of our integrity, it is because we're in scarcity. It's because we're in pain. It's because we're drained. It's because we're burned out. And because we feel like we're trapped because we spent so much money on our degrees and so much money on our, our continuing education and on our books and on our, our training. Cause we pay for supervision guys. Like this is not like, we don't make money doing this work at all. Like it, it may be like 20 years before you start making any money from this. But it's like you may feel shame around the fact that like you spent all this money in, and invested in this and you may feel like you're stuck and you're like, well, I can't start over. I Well, guess what? You don't have to. You can just pivot. And yeah. like I'm, I promise you the this space of coaching has been so fucking expansive and I truly feel like this is where we're going to really heal the world because we're taking away the shackles of you know, what has been put into place to kind of keep us uh, from being able to really tap so fully into accepting 
accessing as uh, being accessible to as many people as possible. And that means standing in our own truth and standing in what healing modalities work for us because everybody is different. And so if we're different and we're unique as healers, we get to really work with people deeply in a deeply unique way. Um, it's, it's just, it'll change the game for you if you choose to kind of explore this path. Now it does require like serious self work. It means that you, yeah, it's unregulated. So here's a deal. Mm -hmm. You got to be on your shit. If you are coming to this and you're listening to this, that's probably you. There are a lot of people who aren't. Does that mean that you shouldn't be a part of this conversation? No. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a coach because there are bad coaches. No, just like you shouldn't. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be a therapist because there are shitty therapists or a doctor because they're shitty doctors. Like you deserve to be a part of this space too. And even more so if you're feeling called to this space and you know you're in your integrity and you are very self-aware and doing that reflective work and doing that healing work so you're not bringing things into the room you have the potential to transform the world and you're going to do a really good job at it um, and feel really good doing it and i wouldn't be saying this if i hadn't accidentally fucking stumbled into this whole thing um and kind of felt like i kind of felt like oh my god like <laughs> How come no none of us are doing this um how come we're all staying stuck so i think it's like it's there's a lot of shame at least for me in the beginning around what felt like giving up on therapy mm. but it wasn't it was kind of recognizing it for what it truly was which was very limiting and very myopic and not accurate to the human experience and how we can really use healing to empower people into transformation. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that vibe? Yeah. And to anyone who's listening to this, who's maybe not looking at becoming a coach, but maybe you're looking into receiving coaching, don't be afraid to ask your potential coaches, what healing work are they actively engaged in, right? Like who's mentoring them? What containers do they have? Um, what books have they read? What has their personal experience been? Because I feel like that ultimately is the question that is meant to hold us accountable, not a piece of paper, not a license, not, you know, years, you know, practicing none of that. I want to know, like, do did you actually do your work? Are you doing your work? Have you cleared enough of your shit that you're not going to bring your shit into my shit? Like, that, yeah. that's what I want to know. And when I think back on the therapists that I've had either as supervisors or personally who were really amazing, and then the ones that were just straight up unethical to the point where, like, I cringe even to think about them continuing to be out there practicing in the world, it is the ones who actually took the time to do their own work and were showing up as somebody who is mostly healed, right? Because it's obviously a continuing journey, mostly healed to be able to hold space for those clients and not have all that other unresolved, unhealed shit bleed into those sessions. Yeah, And yeah. it's, it's not okay to continue this it's practice. a trauma cycle. Like it, it really is, is because I, trauma cycle. Yeah, I, mean, I was actually just remembering that in graduate school, cause I went for marriage and family therapy. Right. I actually remember in one of my introductory classes, the professor said, oh yeah. And just so you know, by the way, out of all of the therapists, marriage and family therapists have the highest divorce rate, have the, those of yeah. marriage and family therapists have the highest divorce rate. And everyone was like, ha 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 ha. And I'm like, I'm sitting there. I'm like, why are we laughing about this? Like, what is wrong that we are literally skilled in communication and the art of relationships and relating to one another, yet our own relationships are failing? Yeah. What? What? It's yeah. because like you don't have time to actually attend to your own relationship or do your own work because you're busy pouring it into everyone else. Oh, yeah. And if you're not okay, how can you be okay for anybody else? The worst of my drinking problems started when I started my internship. <laughs> Like, and it, I was never drinking at my internship. I would never be drunk working with my God. That would never have happened. I would like, no, but at night, at the end of the night, I would go home and smash two bottles of wine because I was like holding so much space for people. And I had clients who were actively suicidal. I had clients who were dealing with like, you know, trigger warning, sexual assault, rape, um, incest, like, you know, or recovering from like, you know, sexual abuse as a child, the stories that we hear as healers are really intense. And 
even as a coach, the stories we hear are really intense. And I think that there's this misconception that what we do is we sit and people just listen, like we just listen and people, we hold space. And in in somewhere, sometime from the times when healers were worshiped and taken care of by their communities and given all the things that they needed so that they could do the, the deep, deep work of holding space and transformation and helping people get better, we lost that recognition of the um, value of that work and how fucking hard it is if you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. So that stuff that ended up happening at the end of the night where I was numbing myself was because I didn't have three hours the next day um, or even two hours that night, three hours that night to sit, chant, do my grounding, maybe get a massage in the morning, maybe get an energy Reiki session, do my own stuff to release anything. Also, we were never taught how to do this. So it's like, what would mm -hmm. you even do? I, I didn't even know how to, I didn't even know I had to do this stuff. Meanwhile, we're getting vicariously traumatized every single day over and over. And so like, how is that going to be sustainable for anybody? You know, we deserve better. We deserve so much more. And so I think the art of holding space has to be recognized. We have to recognize it for ourselves. We do a lot of really, really, really hard emotional labor. And that's something to be proud of. And to also like, that should be like raised up. That should be, you know, I can't think of the word, but you know, that should be appreciated. Um, yeah. And that's why this conversation is so important because ultimately it's beautiful to have this conversation. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are going to be nodding their heads and agreeing with us, but nothing changes if nothing changes. Yeah. And this is exactly why I was this close to getting my license and I had to say no. And trust me, I got shit from my parents, from my supervisor, from my, I have a ton of therapy friends who are licensed, who went mm -hmm. through everything. And they're like, what, what are you having a, a breakdown? Are you going crazy? Like you really think that like you, you shouldn't find, and I, I'm like, no. And I knew for me, like all of the downloads and all of the amazing opportunities that I've been given, that was put in front of me as a choice. Mm -hmm. It was put in front of me as a choice. And it's like, okay, like you can really either actually lean into like this shit that you're doing with Gabby and go all in, or you can half-ass it, go get your license. And then like, basically that's me telling the universe. I actually don't believe in this as much as I say that I do, but I do. I do. Coaching has changed my life. I recognize myself now as a healer, not just a therapist, not just someone who has a master's degree, not just someone who went to school and has a shit ton of student loan debt, actually as a healer, I get to show up as a healer. I get to take care of myself as a healer because I'm demanding it yeah. because I'm demanding it because I said no to the thing that is not serving me and is not serving my community of healers. Mm. And I do want to encourage anyone who is listening to this and is like getting the energy tingles or if you've been nodding your head the whole time, like we, we want you in our family. Yeah, we absolutely. want you in our family. Like if you're Go like, shit. Go <laughs> like shit. And come like, join for us revolution in healing that, you know, you want to do, there is no better time than right now because like that we are running out of time. That's the whole thing. Like the world is crumbling. The system is crumbling. We are waking up like at a rapid pace and, and spiritually as well. And so what we want to offer you guys is if you are feeling called to a mission to change the world and you are someone who resonates with what we're talking about today, you're likely an activated star seed and you're likely like definitely here for this reason. And you don't need to force yourself into a box and do it this way because chances are you're not going to be able to do what you really need to do to what you came here to do and what you, what feels right. So you know, what we like to do is like we provide that space for you guys. And so uh, Ignite is one of those spaces. And so if you are right now working as a therapist, if you're in school to become a therapist, if you are on the licensure path and you're like realizing, I don't want to give this another moment of my energy and I am ready to heal. I am ready to step into the space of leadership then I want to encourage you guys to check out that program. We have been running this program now. It's going to be the fifth time. We're expanding it to six months long. We want to really hold your hand through this whole process because 
Well, you're, you're here to heal. You do not have time to waste. And this program breaks down everything you need to know to start and launch your business online. It's not a boss babe situation. It's not an MLM. I've gotten this question before, which actually was so funny. I was like, how do you even make a healing MLM? I guess like some of the essential oils companies don't, don't come at me in the comments. Um, <laughs> We love our essential oils. We love our essential oils. <laughs> um, but we don't love the boss babe thing. But this isn't like that. This isn't like, I'm going to actually teach you guys, like you're going back to Hogwarts. Like you always know you were there in your head. Um, you're going to actually go to Hogwarts with energetic healers, spiritual healers, um, therapists, coaches, um, yoga practitioners, body healers, like somatic sexologists. I mean, you're entering like the fifth dimension. You're going to meet your soul family. You're going to connect and you're going to together, we're going to hold you through the process of learning how to start a business and give you all the education and skills you need. Because like, in my opinion, we do not need another minute wasted. Like we're not here to um, like give you some business that you can take up and franchise and run. Like, no, you're going to create your vision you're going to set your fees. You're going to create your branding, your website. How do you want to show up as a healer in this world? We will help you make that a reality so that you don't have to work for anybody but yourself. And you can have all of that time and space and capacity to create a life on your terms so you can heal yourself, support yourself, and then give back to the world in like a million times bigger of a way than you ever could have sitting behind a closed door and doing it that way. Now, if you're a therapist through and through who loves working with mentally ill patients and you love holding deep space for crisis and for really, really intense work, then God bless you. I love you. Source bless you, whoever got us. And thank you for doing that work. That doesn't speak to all of us. Some of us like goal setting and future self planning. And we like looking at how we connect the dots from the past, but we don't necessarily want to unpack all of that and sit there, but we're ready to go move forward, change the world and help people get activated. That is really where the coaching space thrives. So um, Amber went through the Ignite program and she was a therapist when she came to see me. And actually um, she and, uh, like actively practicing. <laughs> She's active, and you can do both, by the way, y'all. You can practice therapy and coaching ethically. I'll we'll teach you the very specifically how to protect your license, how to make sure that you're doing things ethically, because there are two different populations, two different methodologies of working. Um, so y'all can do it all. Um, but yes, you don't have to if you don't want to, but yes. <laughs> But yeah, so you went through that program and um, when you went through it, it was three months long, so it was a rapid fire. So what were your favorite parts, takeaways? Like what would you as the student say to few, if, if people are listening, like what would you say to them if they're thinking about it or on the fence? I will say that my favorite part of Ignite was actually what is still my favorite part of Ignite that I actually now get to facilitate as your co-coach. And that is the mindset, energetic, and spiritual transformation that happens in the program. And it is so great that, you know, we give people all of these like strategies and business tools and we help you set things up and we give you, you know, how to like do stuff on Canva and write captions and how to do reels, all the stuff that you need to know to be able to do this and to be able to convert and to be able to have sales and all that. We, we do that all like one-stop shop, top to bottom. That's so awesome. But what really I get most excited in the past, most passionate about is like all of the inside stuff that happens oh, like yeah. between like, you know, really helping people to elevate their mindset, to get into abundance, to work through their limiting beliefs, to figure out like, where are they repeating like intergenerational cycles and helping them break out of that. When imposter syndrome comes knocking on the door, guess who's there to like, tell it to like, go F off, you know, like we are. And yeah. I think it is just, we, I mean, not for nothing. I, I was completely unprepared for how much the Ignite program was change my life, how much it was going to like, I stepped up and I was like, oh my gosh, I get to be this vision I've been holding of myself in my mind for my whole life. Mm -hmm. I get, to, I get to be that person. This program gave me permission to step into my highest self, to do the deep healing work that I really needed to do so that I can show up as a coach and I can sit there in session and I can straight up channel because I get to 
be healed and hold space for myself enough. And, you know, also through all of the amazing connections and networking that have happened as a result of being part of this family. And I, again, I get to show up as this really amazing healer. And that's because there was a straight up energetic spiritual shift that happened for me. And it's happened for however many other people, right? Like yeah. that have gone through the program. And to me, like, that's the real shit. Like that's the real, that's the it's, real it's juicy so part. Funny, And it's like, I created, when I created this program, I didn't have that in mind and I'm obviously a natural healer. And so the way I, I do approach the program is like, um, is that kind of parallel processing. So, you know, you have the one-stop shop for all the business stuff, because like literally you should be out there healing. We don't need you guessing and hiring 25 coaches to teach you what we can teach you in one place. Um, <laughs> and to do it for yourself. So you don't have to pay anybody if you don't want to. Um, but this parallel processing of the inner stuff that comes up to be able to be in a container that's trauma informed, that's held by, um, you know, those of us who are walking the walk and doing our own work and also have spent a tremendous amount of time um, educating ourselves on all of these different processes and psychology and all of these associated things for healing. Like that is a sacred space that it's, it's safe and you know, we've seen so many people who are like, I never open up in these programs, just fall, break down, like be, watch themselves, ask for help, be supported. Like these transformations give me the chills. And you know, me too, I'm sitting here, I have goosebumps. I know, everyone was like going the other day and going back and like reaching out to alumni and just like, it's so fucking cool being able to see that everybody that you reached out to is doing well or doing even better. Um, and even like deeper healing and if they've gone on like multiple healing journeys after Ignite because they realized like all of these different things started to open up. And that is the process. Like the healer is the person who can respect the healing process and hold it with dignity and grace. And that person is the person also doing the work. Yeah. It's called Ignite for a reason, everyone. It's called yeah. Ignite for a reason, but we like, this is like, fire in your ass. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, oh, that's a cute name for a program. Oh no, it's just, it's really, really accurate. It's really, I, really no, it accurate. is really accurate, but, um, I know we've been talking for a hot minute. I didn't realize how long we were going, but yeah, I, this is like, this we, is our this thing. Is how it is, though. Like, so <laughs> just so you guys know, like we are enrolling for the next round. We're taking all of you wayward black sheep of your family. Those yes, you, come. Come yes. join the weird family that we've created of like soul seeking Jedi warriors of the light. Like we take this shit real serious. We're also have a great time doing it. Um, you're going to meet your soul family. If you've been feeling alone on the healing journey, if you've been feeling like you, you just people are fake as fuck um, or that you just you're in the BIPOC community and you're like looking for a space or in, or in a community that feels marginalized and you're looking for a space where we can talk about shit, we can openly discuss what's going on, where you feel seen and heard, um, where you get a unique experience, then please, please, please apply, check out our sales page, um, our offering page, I should say, you know, it's just, it's going to be an amazing time. Uh, we're doing six months, we're doing a four day in person retreat, you're going to get Amber as your amazing lead coach, I'm going to be there also leading, we're going to co lead, and you're going to get Allie who is coming in as our newest support coach um, for this container and we're limiting limiting it to 15 women or women identified individuals and um, we would love for this to be you so if you're listening to this it is not a coincidence the universe has put this in your face um, because we are sending you the signal the bat signal come join us and um it starts september 1st so you have a little time but at least get on a call with amber ask questions see if it's a good fit we also screen, um, so we are looking for specific individuals. And if you think this is you, we are looking for light leaders. Um, so if you feel like you are a light leader and you're being called to bigger, better things, this is going to be for you. So apply, join us, coming out with us, and um, and all of our guest coaches, adjunct faculty, and magical beings, and dive into the woo and the strategy and the healing. And it's going to be an amazing time. Um, what do you think, Amber? Are you excited? I'm excited for the six month container. I'm excited. I just feel like if, if there's like a, a soul out there that's listening to this, I just want you to know, I love you already. I love you already. And I cry on discovery calls. Be prepared for that because like, I just, I just, like, I, I do, I get really involved at, we take on each and every person's journey 
as our own in a non-codependent yeah. way, in a very healthy way. But <laughs> not codependent, <laughs> but we're just in a healthy we're, way. Promise. Yeah, we are just passionate. We really care. And you know, if you've stuck around this far, you know that something that Gabby and I both feel like is our mission. Like this is why we're here to help this paradigm to help shake things up, to help give healers another way to live out their gifts, to, you know, live in alignment with their purpose. And I know because I was, or it felt really icky. And if you're there and you're, you're like coming home at the end of the day, feeling like you've been abused all day, it's because you have, and you do not have to subject yourself to that. Like you yeah. are worthy and deserving of so much more. And, you know, the, is this is the place for for you so stop stop like sacrificing your mental health and your <laughs> your relationships and your well-being so that you can show up and heal there's another better <laughs> more ethical way if this is something that you feel resonates for you yeah truly um well thank you so much for diving into these spicy topics with me today amber i just like the stuff that we always talk about we talk about this stuff in containers we talk about the system we talk about social justice we talk about advocacy accessibility community building um you know it's really important that we sh we are shaping the future guys and it takes everybody and it takes all of us and all of us dedicating the doing to doing the work ourselves on ourselves and um to stepping into leadership as we see it to uh you know usher in this new age of abundance and ease and peace because it starts with us and if we have the torch might as well fucking run with it right <laughs> ignite baby ignite <laughs> oh man uh, but anyway thank you guys for listening thanks for listening to our little rant today and um if you enjoyed this be sure to tag us if you're listening take a screenshot put in your stories say hi um tag at strike dot ignite coaching or at ohm underscore therapy underscore coaching and um and or both and we love you thank you so much have a beautiful day and that's our episode for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining us at the Conscious Leadership Podcast. I'm so excited. This next year, 2021, is going to be huge. We have so many guests that are coming on that you are going to love. I'm going to be doing some more solo casts and own therapy coaching. We have so many things rolling out for you. Retreats, another round of Ignite starting in May, another one starting at the end of the summer, a mastermind, and so many other things. So be sure to stay tuned with us on Instagram. Follow me at ohm underscore therapy underscore coaching and stay tuned for so much goodness coming up. As always, I would love to hear your feedback. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review. And I would love to give you a free copy of my subconscious reprogramming workbook. And that is absolutely free. Just send me a screenshot of your review and on Instagram. And I will be so happy to send that over as my gift for you. And I am sending you so many hugs, so much love. And I hope that this week you are able to find just a little bit more joy in your life. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>